Hey guys, assalamualaikum. Welcome back to another virtual lecture. In this video, we're going to learn about the demand for money. Learning about the demand and supply of money, as well as how the fractional reserve system works, is important. All this is needed for us to learn about monetary policy later. Let's do a little bit of revision. Now, previously, we've learned about the supply of money, or ways to measure money supply. So we've learned there are three measures of money, which are M1, M2, and M3. We know that M1 is the narrowest category of money in that it is very, very liquid, followed by M2 and M3. But we haven't learned how the money supply looks like. Now here, if you have a diagram, normally here would be the quantity of money. And here is real interest rate. Okay, so the supply of money is usually a straight vertical line here. Okay, this is because supply of money does not depend on interest rates. Rather, it depends entirely on the decisions made by the central bank. Now that you know about the supply of money and how it looks like, let's continue our study on the money market by learning about the demand for money. Now, people demand money for many reasons. The first is called the transaction demand for money, or DT. This happens when money is demanded to buy goods and services. Now, you may have remembered one of the functions of money is as a medium of exchange, right? So that function is related to this particular demand for money. Another reason why people demand for money is called the asset demand for money, or DA. This happens when people hold their money as an asset. Now, this particular reason is associated with the second function of money, which is as a store of value. Now, these financial assets can be in the form of stocks or private and government bonds, as well as money itself. Combining both the transaction demand for money and the asset demand for money will give us the total demand for money. In other words, DM is a horizontal summation of DT and DA. Now let's take a look at how the demand for money looks like. Let's first of all focus on the transaction demand for money. As you can see here, the transactions demand for money is vertical. This is because people demand for money to buy goods and services not because of interest rate or not due to the interest rate. Rather, people buy goods and services depending on their level of nominal GDP or nominal income. In contrast, the asset demand for money has a negative or an inverse relationship with interest rate. This is because as interest rate gets lower, it is much cheaper for people to demand for money or to buy them. Whereas if the interest rates get higher, what it means is the price, quote unquote, of money is more expensive, people will demand lesser of the money. Therefore, the shape of the asset demand for money is downward sloping. Adding both the transactions demand for money and the asset demand for money will give us the total demand for money or DM. What it means by a horizontal summation is this. Say at the 5% interest rate level, transactions demand for money is 100 billion. And at 5% interest rate level also, the asset demand for money is another 100 billion. So the total demand for money at 5% interest rate is 200 billion, which means it's 100 plus 100. So it's a horizontal summation. That is how we get the total demand for money at a particular interest rate level. Now that we have the total demand for money, we can combine it together with the supply of money. So this becomes the complete money market. And the point at which the demand and supply of money intersects, we will have the equilibrium interest rate, or the price of money. Now I'm going to show you what happens to the equilibrium interest rate when there's a shortage of money or a surplus of money. Okay, to see how the equilibrium interest rate changes, we start with the MT diagram. Okay, so here is basically the quantity of money. Okay, and here would be our real interest rate. Or sometimes we can just put it as I and it's in percent. So what I'm going to show you here is the basic or the initial condition first. So we're going to show you a supply of money and here's the demand for money. Okay, so at this point is the intersection point. So this is our first um, equilibrium interest rate. So let's say this is at 5%. Okay, and at 5% interest rate, our 
um, equilibrium money supply is 200 billion. So if you're wondering where I get all these figures, it's actually from the um, diagrams that I showed you before. Say we have a shortage of money. Okay, what do you guys understand by shortage? Okay, what that means is there's a fall in the supply of money. Okay, so now we have to make the assumption, okay? Our assumptions are, one, supply of money is vertical. This is because we assume the supply of money is fixed for a specific period of time because, well, it's determined by the central bank, right? And we know from the theory just now, the demand for money is downward sloping due to the negative relationship uh, between the asset demand of money with interest rates, okay? So, now, to, in order to sketch or to understand the shortage of money, we have to see that the only thing that's able to move about here is the supply of money. Okay, because it's being controlled by the central bank, right? So the central bank has the authority to shift or to move the supply of money. So how can we sketch a shortage of money? Supply of money will shift to the left, okay? Okay, so I'm going to show it to you here. So this will be our new supply of money, SM1 or hat. Okay, so here we will have a new amount, okay? Now at this new amount we can see that there will be a new equilibrium interest rate. And as you can see, the new equilibrium interest rate is higher than before. Let's say it's at 10%. So if you're wondering why do we have a new equilibrium interest rate, it's because at the current or the existing interest rate at 5%, we see that there's a shortage here, okay? So I'm going to write it down. There's a shortage here. Shortage of what? Shortage of money. Why? Because the demand for money is at 200, okay? Whereas the supply of money is only at 150. That is why there's a shortage of money. And, well, you can see that this will not hold. There will be an upward pressure, okay, to reach a new equilibrium, okay? Because you know what equilibrium means? There's no tendency for the new interest rate to shift, okay? So this is point where both the supply and demand for money is equals, Okay, that is why we have a new equilibrium interest rate. Now let's take a look at another situation where we have a surplus of money. Okay, so just like before, we start off with an empty XY plane, okay, whereby here's the quantity of money, and here we have our real interest rate expressed in percentage. Okay, so let's draw the initial condition first. Here's our supply of money. It's a vertical line. Okay, remember why it's a vertical line, yeah? It's vertical because we assume that the supply of money is independent um, from the interest rate and is determined by the central bank, okay? And then we have here the demand for money, which is downward sloping due to the fact that there's a negative relationship between um, the asset demand for money and the interest rate, okay? So here would be our first equilibrium interest rate at 5%. So I'm keeping it at 5% just like the previous example. And here it's um, 200. Okay, right. So now let's sketch the situation where there's a surplus of money. What that means is the supply of money increases, okay? Okay, so how do we sketch that? Supply of money shifts to the right. So here we have a new supply of money, same one. Okay, so what that means is it will lead to a fall in interest rate here because this is our new intersection point. So here we'll have a new equilibrium interest rate, let's say at 2.5%. Okay, so if you're wondering why is it when there's an increase in money supply, why does it lead to a fall in interest rate? It's because at the existing interest rate level at 5%, we can see here we have a surplus. Okay, we have a surplus of money. Surplus means there's more supply compared to the demand for money. Okay, so this will not hold the equilibrium. What happens is there will be a downward pressure for the interest rate to come to a new equilibrium. Okay, right. So I hope you understand. Oh, and let's, let's put on the new value. Okay, guys, now let's recap. When there's a shortage of money, what that means is the supply of money will shift to the left, and as a result, the equilibrium interest rate will increase, okay, due to the shortage of money. And here, if the supply of money shifts to the right, the equilibrium interest rate will fall 
okay, due to the surplus of money. All right, guys, so now that we know how to determine the equilibrium interest rate and what happens when there's a shortage or surplus of money and how the equilibrium interest rate changes, let's move on to the next subtopic, which is um, interest rates and bonds. As you can see here, there's actually a relationship, okay, between interest rates and bond prices. Specifically, they have a negative relationship with each other. Okay, so uh, in order to explain this further, let's go back to our previous example and we'll check it out. Suppose money supply falls. As you can see here, the supply curve shifts to the left. Now, as we've seen before, this will create a shortage of money. What that means is the amount of money available in the market has fallen. So how can people get more money? So remember our assumption, people will either hold money or bonds. So now, when people want more money, due to the fact that there's a shortage of money, they will try to sell more of their bonds. Okay, so when they sell their bonds, the idea is for them to get more money. Now, can you imagine now in the bond market? Okay, in the bond market, we can see that the supply of bonds will be more than the demand for bonds. Okay, because everyone has the same idea. Since there's a shortage of money, everyone wants to have more money. When everyone wants to have more money, they will be selling off their bonds. So now there'll be more supply of bonds in the bond market. So what happens when there's more supply than demand? What happens is the price of bonds will fall. Okay, so when there's an increase in interest rate or the price of money, there will be a fall in the price of bonds. Okay, now let's look at the other situation. Suppose supply of money increases, okay? So you can see here the supply curve shifts to the right. Okay, so what happens is there will be a surplus of money. Now what that means is there's extra or additional money in the money market. So people will have additional money, so they will want to, uh, you know, spend it, right? So remember our assumption just now, people will either hold money or bonds. So now that people have a lot more money to spare, uh, they might be thinking of ways on how to spend their money, right? So uh, using our assumptions just now, people then now buy more bonds. Okay, so now let's look at the bond market. When people want to buy more bonds, what happens is the demand, okay? The demand for bonds will be relatively more than the supply of bonds. Okay, so what happens when there's more demand than supply? What happens is it will shoot the price up. Okay, so the price of bonds will increase. So as you can see here, when the interest rate or the price of money falls, it will lead to an increase in the price of bonds.